All right, so we're here back in the studio here with Lance Smith, CEO, the real estate informant, informing everyone about the game of real estate today. So today we're going to be covering Grant Cardone, and uh, we're going to be informing uh, on some clips and uh, uh, mentioning to our audience and analyzing Grant Cardone's statements. And so right now, we're going to start with the first one. How's everybody doing today? What's up, bro? I was wondering, like, you're going, you're going, all, you're going <laughs> yeah. straight in. Like, he's going, he's going straight for it. <laughs> What's up, David? How you doing, David? I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing fine and dandy. Everything is good. Dandy. Dandy. That's a good word. I haven't heard that word in a while. Me either. I, that's like something my grandma used to say. How old are y'all? Don't know how old are you? I don't know. I'm, I'm 33, but I mean. Oh, you're a young man. Yeah. I'm a young buck. Yep. A young fella. A strapping young lad. Oh, not too much yes. information for me, but you're young. Wow. Uh, what was a British slogan? Oh, and here we're introducing Angel. What's like, up? What's up? What's how y'all up? doing? And uh, today, as you can see, wow, these are a lot of books here. How many books does Cardone University <laughs> have? Do you get these in the mail? Like, is it through Amazon? No, How's actually, this work? They were actually very, um, very expensive, right? So basically, based on the fact that... Um, the majority of you guys know I, I run a few different organizations, all in the real estate sector, from real estate brokerage to uh, mortgage banking and financing to my own real estate syndicate, uh, raising funds for uh, pretty much to provide home ownership for um, pretty much people who are looking to buy a home for their first time. So what we do is we buy, fix, and flip an enormous, a lot of proper, enormous amount of properties in New York, specifically Long Island. Uh, in doing that, in cultivating one of my sales teams, the very first thing I bought as far as training was Cardone University. And buying Cardone University was very useful. Right? It was very helpful. Um, as far as there's a digital platform that he has with Bradley, and it's uh, the Lightspeed version, and the team trained on that. As well as, you know, because, like, I don't want to get the narrative confused. Right? I'm a, I'm a, I understand the theology behind a man like Grant Cardone. Right? He's made it. He's there. Right. He's made it. He's there. He's at another stratosphere when it comes to recognition, when it comes to the real estate, when it comes to the game, when it comes to success. Right? He's a success story in this country, which is the majority. That, like That's the reason why I have all this stuff. Like, I spent tens, hundreds of thousands. I don't want to say hundreds because I don't think I spent two, but I'm well over $100,000 in um, him, his training, his organization, getting my people trained by him, actually flying down from New York to his headquarters, flying down to s different specific events he had, specifically the um, training boot camp that he had, right? The business boot camp for business owners and your team. I've done that a few times, always sat in VIP seating, you know, first row, front, center, <laughs> to see what the guy had to say. Because I, like I said, I was in, I, I can't say was, I'm still, I still admire, you know, what he does. But at um, certain there's a certain demographic that he speaks to, and when he gets on a platform like I saw him on with Vlad TV, it's just a different demographic. It's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. So when you say things like, you know, home ownership isn't for everyone, it's dumb to buy a house, it depends on who you're speaking to and your audience. And specifically, the reason that we're even commenting on this is because the people that I speak to and who I'm looking to help and who I'm looking to give information on, how to become, not even not only, before you even become wealthy, like just establishing, establishing some ground roots in this country, establishing some structure for your household, for your family. Like We don't have the same opportunities that someone like a Grant Cardone may have. So he, he wouldn't even understand that conversation based on who he is and what he looks like. So with that being said, it's, it's just... It's quite unfortunate that um, the audience that he speaks to just doesn't completely understand what he means and why he means it. So I'm, I'm going to bring a little bit of clarity to that, right. not to confuse the narrative. Like I said before, I'm not coming at him. Like I said, he's a the dude is a success story, and once you reach a certain level of success in your own right, that, then you can agree to some of the things he says, some of his, some of his points of views. But on a on a platform like Vlad TV, who he's speaking to. You just have to be conscious of who your audience is. Like if you're on Fox News, <laughs> then you can spit that, right? Because mm -hmm. you're usually you're speaking to a certain demographic in, in, in Fox News, and they, they get that, they understand that, and you're speaking the same language. But it's not to be, it has to be translated differently, and actually you have to start in the beginning. You have to start more so in the beginning. And that's what we're looking to do here to give people information on, you know, what, what it means to start in the beginning. 
And while you do, you need to own a home. Right? And well, it's interesting that you brought that up because uh, let's listen to a clip here. It's called I'm Not Trying. And I, I just want to hear what you think about that. The only people that are trying to make sense of a house are people that, that are either trying to sell you a house. I'm not trying to sell anybody anything. Like, I'm trying to help people create financial freedom for themselves. There's not one report in the history of the world, 7 billion people, of anyone creating financial freedom because they bought a house. Ah, uh, Uncle G. Mm-hmm. You're not trying to sell anybody anything. <laughs> you wrote a book, Seller Be Sold. You are Says looking the to cow. sell How much are these books again? Do. Like, come on. Like, you are trying to sell. You're selling on mm-hmm. a daily. You sold me. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm, sold. I'm drinking the juice. I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. You sold me. <laughs> so it's not a matter of whether you're looking to sell. Like, you're not selling an individual particular home. You're not a real estate broker or an agent. Right? You're not selling your home. But you're selling an idea. You're selling a concept. And, yes, it makes sense. But you're selling something. So when he says he's not selling anything, of course, I find <laughs> that to be untrue because I've been a huge proponent and a huge consumer of the things that he sold. So I find that to be untrue and living proof that he does sell things. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so um, when it comes to, you know, homeowners and selling a home, I'm not doing this particular interview or podcast to sell anything. I don't have anything. I don't have anything to sell right now. Like I don't have a book. I don't have an online course. I don't have um, merch. Like I don't have anything to sell. I'm just giving information and information that's needed, much needed by my community. So when it comes to home ownership, it's extremely important because what he doesn't understand is this. And how would he? So let's start there. How would he understand this? You can, when you're Grant Cardone and you look like Grant Cardone at any age of life, let's use a specific geographic area. Let's say you're from Miami. Right? I love Miami. Great city. Mm-hmm. You're from Miami. You're from Hialeah, Florida. I don't care who you are. You're a football player. You're a basketball player. You're a young entrepreneur. Um, your paperwork is right. What I mean by that is your income is documented. Your credentials as far as your credit, it's, you know, A1. And you're looking to rent, whether in a building, whether a private residential home, but there's a particular area that you want to rent in. Let's say it's Boca. Mm-hmm. I'm from Hylia. I run a successful business, and this is all theoretical. I run a successful business, and I want to rent a home in Boca. Whether or not I rent a home in Boca is up to the person that actually owns the piece of real estate that I'm looking to rent, if I'm actually even a candidate that they're looking to even rent to. So at that point, I don't have the, as he said, freedom. I don't have the freedom because renting is not a right. It's not a right. Who's determining my future at that point? Because I want to live in Boca. I want my kids to be in that particular school district. The landlord. Exactly. And if the landlord is in disagreement with me when I, no matter what my credentials are, let's say, let's, and let's not make this a a race thing. Let's say, for instance, I'm 26 years old Mm -hmm. and I want to rent a, 10,000 square foot home in Boca. If I want to rent a 10,000 square foot home in Boca and the landlord that I'm looking to rent from looks at me, looks at my current, and I actually, on paper, I look amazing. But there's another option behind me and the option behind me looks more like the landlord. It's not a 26-year-old person. It's a person who, who seems, you know, financially responsible because they bought a home before. And, and this is a situation where, you know, it's not their first rental, then landlord might turn their nose at me. Mm-hmm. Because at that particular point, he might feel like I'm not responsible enough, even though I have the credentials and the income. He might not want to give me a shot because that's a risk. So I don't have the same luxury of living in that neighborhood to rent. I don't care if it's even a condo. So if I don't have that luxury, if in fact I don't buy it, what well, the only way I'm going to get in that neighborhood is by actually buying it. Yeah, yeah. And then who, as long as, as long as my credentials are correct on paper, right, I have mm-hmm. my three and a half percent down if I'm going FHA or five percent if I'm going conventional, then I could be in this, I can entertain the same neighborhood. Now let's, that, let's take that same conversation and let's bring that to a, a more real, realistic situation. It's not a 10,000 square foot home. 
let's say it's a 1500 square foot home, a regular typical 1500 square foot home. And it's in Hollywood, Hollywood, Florida, which is not an affluent area of Florida, but it's, it's a decent. Good town. It's close middle, enough. Yeah, it's in middle income, median income mm-hmm. area. It's not an absorb. It's not an absorbent lot of money for me to rent in Hollywood, right? If mm-hmm. I'm, I believe the median price of a house in Hollywood is somewhere between three hundred, three hundred and four hundred thousand yes. dollars. So if you're looking to obtain a mortgage, it's only three and a half percent down. So you're looking at if you negotiate the right deal, you'll only put around ten thousand dollars down to buy the house. You negotiate your closing costs. Wow. You put ten thousand dollars down to buy that home. That doesn't change your life. And ten grand is not going to start a business that's going to change your life overnight. You take that $10,000 and you invest in your future. You invest in what you're investing in at that point is you're investing in your future. You're investing Mm -hmm. in your family. You're investing in stability. Because say, for instance, I did rent in that same home. It's a year lease or two year lease at a time. At the end of the first year, the landlord says, I don't want to rent the home anymore. I want to sell it because I want to buy a bigger boat. Right. I want to buy a bigger boat. So I want to sell the home. I'm liquidating my assets. <laughs> so now me as a tenant, what am I, I'm forced to find somewhere else to live. And if you I'm have forced, kids. Or and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm forced to up and say I can't buy a house in the same exact school district. I'm forced to uproot my children and put my children in a different school district. And I called this place home. And that's the key word, home. What we have as a people have to understand that we have to like home ownership is extremely important extremely important especially to people who look like me extremely important and what he's saying on the back end of his conversation yes once you accumulate some wealth then you can do all those things you can buy and rent to yourself and start businesses but where do you start if you don't have an actual foundation that starts at home you can't start Mm -hmm. so you have to own the home like that's where it starts you put your minimum down payment three and a half percent down to five percent and you buy a home and you create that concrete, concrete stability for your family. And then you make the actual decisions you need to make moving forward progressively in what you want to do as a business person or a real estate investor or whatever have you. Let's talk about another, let's talk about, let's bring up another aspect. I'm renting from my landlord and I'm having an issue, right? Maybe I changed jobs. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll decide to take a risk and become an entrepreneur. And there's a month that I've come up short on my rent. Mm-hmm. And that situation lasts longer than I thought it would. Or I wanted it to. Let's say, for instance, I got sick. And I'm in the home and I'm renting. And I wasn't able to make my mortgage payment for the a month or 45 days or 60 days. There's no option. My land is going to kick me out. I'm gone. I'm out. I'm done. Then I got to figure out all. I got to. I got to scrounge up another down payment to go rent something else somewhere else. However, if I own it, I have options. I can possibly restructure my payment with my bank. Like I determine my own future. I can go, you know, sixty days late on my mortgage with my bank. If and I'm not. I'm not a proponent of people going there anymore. But let's just say life happens because things happen, mm-hmm. and you take that risk. And I go a month and a half late then I can actually catch up. You can't catch up with your landlord. There's an eviction note on your door. You got to go. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You'll be lucky wow. if your stuff's not in the street. Yeah. yeah. But if you actually own it, you have the ability to restructure and work that thing out. And it's not the same situation with a landlord who doesn't want to hear it. Mm-hmm. So there are certain things that, like, and let's get back into really quickly, the down payment aspect. Listen, first time home buying, you do not have to put 20% down. That is a myth. You do not, listen, if you're buying a home for $300,000, you're not putting $60,000 down plus closing costs to buy it as a first-time home buyer. You don't have to. You don't have to. FHA, Federal Housing Administration, (laughs) Mm -hmm. minimum down payment requirement, 3.5%. Wow. Two years on your job. Two years. You show two years of stable income. You have your W-2s and your pay stubs that actually show what you can afford Based on what you can afford, they're going to lend you money. They're not going to put you in a situation. It's not predatory lending because it's based on what you actually bring in every month. So as long as you have some type of, as long as you're financially aware of what you can afford and budgeting properly, you have to start somewhere. And 
starting somewhere is buying that first house. It's saving that small first down payment and you start from there. And when it comes to owning a business and it comes to, yes, later on, if you want to buy homes and you want to buy rental properties and you want to create passive income for yourself and you want to collect rent from other people, you can do that. But guess what? I am a real estate broker. I own two real estate brokerages. I'm a mortgage banker, right? I actually own a private mortgage company. I have a real estate syndicate just like rent. I raise money as well. And I deploy capital by real estate. Like I do the same things. And he knows, like, and this is like his organization, certain people in his organization I have relationships with, and they know this. I know this. We all at this table know this. Me knowing those things, I also know that in order to actually become an investor, you're not going to become a real estate investor if you don't own your first piece of real estate. You can't come to me, David, and say you want to buy an investment property to fix and flip, and you want to uh, you want a loan to fix and you want to buy a home, you want to fix it, put it back on the market because you watched HGTV, mm-hmm. and you want to become a real estate investor, and you want to create some wealth from yourself. The very first thing I'm going to ask you is, what's your rental portfolio look like? <laughs> mm-hmm. What do you actually own? And you're saying to yourself, well, I don't own a home yet. This is going to be my first one. Guess what? Guess how much money you can borrow? None. Because if you don't own anything and it's supposed to be a commercial loan in order for you to invest in real estate, I don't trust you. I think maybe you'll move in because the restriction, there's a different, there's a different level of restriction. It's actually easier to buy a home, to buy a property, to fix and flip than it is to buy your very, there's no paperwork involved. There are no W-2s, there are no pay stubs. You just need a couple bucks in the bank showing that you can, uh, pretty much make your down payment and you have rehab money to buy the house and an investor, a hard money lender, will they'll lend you, and there's private firms, they'll lend you the money, I'm one of them, will lend you the money to buy it, will also lend you the money for the construction so you can fix it, so you can turn a profit, put it back on the market and create a new homeowner. But if you're not a homeowner yourself, how can you possibly understand that concept? Yeah. You're a risk. Mm-hmm. You're like, it's like a flight risk. You go to court, like, yeah, he's a flight risk. A flight risk. What do they say? What's a flight risk? A flight risk is when you go to court, you have some type of case, and the judge says, I think David's going to leave. <laughs> he's going to do the opposite of what he told me if I give him the ability to. And that's what lend, private lenders look like. Because he's got like, no collateral. Right. They, 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 the private lender will look at you like, why would I lend you money to buy a house to fix and sell and you don't even own one? True. So that's where it starts. You start there. Wow. So the conversation he's having, it's a giraffe conversation. It's a giraffe conversation. But he has to bring his neck down and speak <laughs> to the people who don't have a giraffe neck. And maybe it's a turtle he's having a conversation <laughs> that's trying to grow. Right. Right. Or a baby giraffe to not be you know, so condescending. Maybe it's a, a, a giraffe, a Grown giraffe and a baby giraffe. Mm-hmm. Both got next, but they haven't grown there yet. So he's fallen on a lot of deaf ears with his message. And um, I think you just got to start at square one when given this type of information, especially, and you have to be aware of the platform you're on. Glad TV, that's a platform, that's an urban network platform that we pay attention to. So his message is not being received the way he wants it to on all platforms. And depending on who you're speaking to, you just have to be conscious of those things before you get in front of people. And um, like I said, no disrespect to Uncle G. I got all this stuff. Look, business boot camp, workbooks, <laughs> and Grant's playbook. And I spent thousands of dollars on this um, called on university. So like I said, I'm not hating. But at the end of the day, it's like, who are we really talking to? And let's make sure we speak to the right people about the right thing. You had mentioned uh, something before we gone on the air uh, regarding home ownership and building equity in your home. Um, about uh, tell me more about that. The mutual fund, it's like a bank account when you buy no, a mutual, house. You can, mutual fund, you're talking about something totally different. What we spoke of, mm-hmm. you asked me about what you did was you asked me about um, the opportunity for once you own a home, right? Because when you buy right, you buy a house with a little bit of equity, you get a little bit of a head start, then hopefully it'll appreciate. Once it appreciates, that gives you the ability to refinance the home. And once you refinance the home, you take cash out. Once you take that cash out, you have the ability. Now you can move a little bit. Now you can invest in yourself. Now you can invest in that next property. But 
the biggest way to gain to gain bank for you to actually buy the investment property is to own the first one. Mm -hmm. So say for instance, if you bought a house five years ago to live in, and at that time it was worth $300,000 and now you want to start a business, you've paid your payments on time. So your principal's gone down, not that much, it's only five years, but it's appreciated. And now maybe it's worth $400,000 or dependent based on this market. probably, if you bought it five years, it's maybe 450 and you have the ability to pull up 80 grand out of the home you take that 80 grand and you can actually start a business wow. with only a, a few short years of you just doing what you're supposed to do and keeping your agreement with the bank, making your mortgage payments and watching the market appreciate. And that's how you can realistically start. But it all starts outside of that. Like that's level two. Okay. That's the business part of it. That's yes. Only go, it's an excellent. Let me be clear. It's the way to your financial future is owning your very first home and cementing your legacy for your family and cementing stability for your children so you don't your children aren't moving around based on what the landlord dictates from school district to school district neighborhood to neighborhood because I was a product of that like I, I did that as a kid and then they, the message that needs to be conveyed is what we need to do as a people is we need to understand that control your own future dictate your own future it all starts at home you have to own one because if you don't, you end up like me, like between the ages of, let's say, you know, five and graduating high school, I moved around so much that I didn't really have the same friends throughout my whole entire childhood. That's probably the same story for a lot of people that look and sound like me and are looking to find their way in this real estate situation, or just period, looking to buy a home, period, and maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's not. Of course it's a good idea. It's a good idea for you and your family. It's the best idea. It's the only idea. Own your piece of real estate. Get a government loan. Three and a half percent down. Wow. That's that's doable. That's, that's doable. You can, depending on what type of job, like you can literally take your tax return, Bank that, depending on what type of job you have. If you banked, if you banked your tax return one year, and then you banked it your first year at your job, and then you banked it the second year just at your job, and just kept working there for two years, boom, guess what? Two years on the job, two years tax return banked, you have enough money for a down payment. And some people could do it off in one year. Get out of that rental. Get out of the rental mindset. Mm -hmm. Get out of the rental mindset. We have to be in the ownership mindset. We have to. We have to own. And Grant Cardone is a guy who doesn't necessarily get that. And Not that he has to, but mm -hmm. it's just different. He doesn't get that because he doesn't have to. I, me personally, tons of money. Credit, good on paper. If I decide to go rent a home, a vacation home, in, let's go back to Boca, and the landlord meets me, say yeah, I don't know if I want to rent to this guy <laughs> I don't know and there's another candidate that he feels more comfortable with then he might rent to that candidate just because he didn't feel as comfortable but I wanted to be in that building or I wanted to be in that home so now what I gotta do I gotta put my ace car I gotta buy it because yeah. I can Yeah. but and everybody can't do that he also said something very wow. interesting uh, Grant Cardone he was um now, you've done most of your work in New York. He was saying uh, that nobody should buy real estate where there's snow. I just want you to hear this clip. Uh, if you could play Nobody Should. Like, like nobody should be buying real estate in Detroit. You should, yeah. Nobody should be buying real estate where there's snow. If there's snow on the ground, like go south. I look at Houston, Texas. I look at Tampa, Orlando, Miami, uh, even the Mobile, Alabamas, the Atlanta, Georgias, so all this migration is happening. And the more dumb shit that New York and New Jersey and California does, the more it just pushes all of these people to migrate to where there's a, a less tax burden. And you're a New York guy. Uh, you've done a lot of your work in New York. Um, what, would you, what would you say in that statement? I don't get that. I mean, I've sold, bought, bought full, sold hundreds of properties in New York 
created home ownership for hundreds of families. Um, and like I said, he's speaking from a different. I still fly commercial. Okay, <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. I'm still in a position where, even though I fly, you know, I fly first class when I get on a plane. But I fly commercial, and when I fly with my team, we and you know, even like yeah. we fly, we fly first, but we fly commercial still. Mm-hmm. If I was f- flying a G5 everywhere I went, then I'd probably talk like that too. Okay, it's all about perspective. He has a different perspective, so come on, like if. He doesn't want to make money in this where it snows, but somebody does. Somebody <laughs> yeah, does. Somebody has to live there. He has <laughs> options. His options are different. He doesn't have the same like my options. Like different people's options are different. Like uh, the options are different. You know, it's it's a. Of course, that's more of a. Investing in simply in places that don't have snow. That's like a red ocean theory. Then you're doing what everyone else wants to do. Red ocean is you know where all the. Sharks in the water, and it's creating a lot of blood, and everyone wants to go to where it's hot and where it's warm and it's sexy. But there are plenty of areas in New York, like even a great investment, a great investment area in New York, like anywhere if you New York upstate, mm-hmm. anywhere around colleges, okay. they're constant tennis. Like you come, like come on, that, bro, come on. What do you mean? Like of course you have to rent with it. Like come, who's you have? To, <laughs> it's just it's just no it's just and it's not bad because you do it doesn't make sense and also regarding so who's, wait don't wait a minute okay <laughs> so if you're saying you shouldn't invest in real estate and so basically you shouldn't create home ownership for people who want to live in the cold like there are people who want to live where it snows some people love the weather and they love snowfall and they love deer mm-hmm. and they love snowmen and they love you know snowy sports Winter and they hate Florida like, and skiing. <laughs> they hate like, and hate like come. On. That's just that's just like I said. He just, the perspective has to be widened because it's very opinion based. Like it's it's very it's just not um, practical. The advice, but it's opinion. His opinion is his opinion. It's just not practical. But it can be somewhat dangerous, depending on who the listener. Because listen, Grant has a follow. Man, he got a follow. Grant has a following. And depending on who's listening, they might convert their whole way of thinking based on what he does and what they see. You know, they say when you you shoot for the stars, it's okay if you hit the sky. But you shoot for the stars with him, you might not get off the porch. Wow, it's like hoop dreams. <laughs> I remember that movie. Yeah, bro. Uh, but it's it's interesting. I was at the uh, we were also at the real estate wealth expo in New right. Jersey, and and I I just remember watching Grant Cardone speak at seven in the morning, and uh, I know I know you need to say some eccentric things to get the crowd, especially early in the morning, to engage them. But then he pulled out some cash, and he said this was worthless. And I just remember thinking to myself, and I know he's bright, I know he's sharp, but I'm thinking I'm like. How do you buy groceries with real estate? That's I ju- again. You had mentioned it's the audience. He's re- he's speaking to a different baby class. giraffe. Yes, I get what he's trying to say, mm-hmm. but he wasn't really talking to you. He just happened to be there, mm-hmm. and that's what happens a lot of times. It gets confused because people who are there, they don't grasp the concept because he's not speaking to the masses. He's speaking to the other giraffes in the room, mm-hmm. and, they, and they get it. I get what he means by, you know, money is like pa- there's only so much you can do with paper. Mm-hmm. They make paper every day. There's only so much you can do with paper. Credit, real estate, assets. That's how you accumulate wealth. Like, you can have as much paper as you can fit in your pocket. You can have paper equal to your body weight. I don't care if it's all hundreds. I own a piece of real estate that's worth more than that, right? Like, mm-hmm. you understand what I'm saying? So I get what he's saying, but you just got to be clear on who you're speaking to. Do you think that's dangerous advice for a first time person? It's dangerous only if you're um if you're on the grant train and you don't know when to get off. What I mean by that is like the train stop like every like the, you're on the grant train. Like I take the train every day. So based on my offices being on Long Island and me living in Manhattan, I take the train every day. It's like a fifteen minute ride. But every once in a while, like the train is like you gotta get between there's like eleven stops. <laughs> so when he starts talking to the time that he's done talking, 
most people should get off at some stop before he gets to the end. Because if you don't get off at some stop, you're going to take the whole entire ride, and you're going to probably miss some of the scenic route because you probably you shouldn't have went all the way. You got to know when to get off, get more information on that thing, and then you get back on the train. Some people are just riding to dying on this train. Wow. So it's, it's um, and it, it's, I wouldn't say dangerous. I mean, everybody has a mind their own. You have to, you still have to be conscious of um, how you apply things. And a lot of people are asking that question, like, okay, that sounds good, that sounds good, but where do I start? And then other people are not asking that question. They're just like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. I should never buy anything. I should just rent. And it's not, and maybe it's a don't buy a home, invest in my fund, the car on capital thing. I don't know if it's that because he has non-accredited investors too. A non-accredited investor means you don't have to have any experience in investing in real estate. I have I direct my own fund as well. So if you don't have any experience investing in real estate, you can still invest in that fund. And maybe he's, maybe that's the angle. I don't look, check it out because he sells. Let me, t- man, let me tell you all the money I spent with this guy. Check this out. So I call, right? I, um, the very last boot camp I I wanted to attend, it's a few weeks ago, actually, ironically. And I called, and I called someone who works for the organization on the cell phone. I'm like, what's going on? I, um, I want to go to the boot camp. You know, I've been a constant, um, you know, like I'm a client at this point. Like I spend lots of money. You know me. The fact that I actually have your cell phone number and you see, like, you know me. Picked up the phone, like, hey, Lance, what's up? So I want to get a ticket to the um, boot camp for me and another member of my team. I know it's last minute. It's only a couple of days before. But I want to go because I, I want to bring one of my guys and I want him to grasp that information. He's the new directing manager of one of my firms. And I want to bring him because the last time I went, there was, like, good information. I want him to grasp that live. Like, I want him to be able to take it in and own it because there's a lot of good speakers as this event. And I think it's very, the boot camp is very, um, it's powerful. And you can come around with, come back with, if you come back with one good nugget, then it was a good experience, and usually we come back with multiple. So I wanted to bring my guy. I think it was like it was a couple, like you know, five, ten, five, whatever it was. And then um, she's like, "Oh, Grant's right here." She's like, "Grant, I got Lance on the phone. He wants to come. It was a little late, but he wants to, he wants two tickets. Uh, can we take care of him? Can we discount? Can we even discount?" <laughs> he said, "Charge him more." <laughs> <laughs> and I literally heard him. I'm like, <laughs> "Wow!" Like. This is what I heard. I'm like, he's like, charge him more. And I'm just like, wow. he's late. I'm making room for him. Wow. And I'm like, really? Wow. Like, not even, like, charge him more, bro? Like, I'm, I support your whole thing. Like, what do you mean? like charge him? So, like I said, he operates on a different, his mind just works different. If someone's a supporter of mine for years, supporting the movement, and they're a, uh, they're just supporting me. Why would I say, me personally, where I come from, I'm just different, charging more? It didn't really sit well with me. But then I got had to analyze like who I'm dealing with, and that's just a different type of person. It's a different type of mindset. We come from a different place. It's all about the money, the money, the money, the money. The thing that matters to us, a lot of time, like people are looking. We can't get to a like I can't get to a place where money matters that much. I can't, I got too many social issues here in America mm-hmm. to put that much emphasis on money and what it means. Like, I can't, like, my mental mindset can't start with money. It can't. It doesn't. It will never. It's not about money for me as much as it is about empowering people. Because I know where I came from. I know how difficult it was. And I've been in situations where I've been a guy standing next to a guy, and we both had the same opportunity, the same shot, and I was better at it than he was. But I didn't get picked, and I know why I didn't get picked. Let's talk about that movement. Um, so it's the – I wanted to hear more about the empowerment of the movement that you're running uh, for all those who haven't heard on the show before. Yeah, man. So um, basically I've been – for the last 17 years, I've been a student of real estate. Right, I've been – uh, relatively successful. I had my ups and I had my downs, but because I can actually sit here today with my own, you know, we're in my podcast room, we're in my company. Um, I own several different businesses. I've sold, you know, bought and sold many homes. I've parlayed 
my experience into brokering and like I got into before, brokering and lending and um, creating other real estate investors and creating home ownership for others and fixing people's credit and building business credit, just so many different things, so many different verticals in the real estate space that what I do now is not only do I help of help cultivate other real estate investors from whether they want to buy, fix, and sell. I also help them with passive income if they want to buy, fix, and rent. Um, and who they're looking, like me personally, like my thing is I am a proponent of home ownership. So the homes that I actually sell, yes, I do as the seller give concessions and help people get into homes. Right, what, I, what is a concession? A concession is if you buy a home from my firm, then what we do is you bring your minimum down payment, which is 3.5%. Typically, we're selling homes between three and 400000 because I focus on the middle market. I focus on middle market America. I focus on people making a transition from renting to owning and breaking that cycle of not owning. And you may be the first one in your entire um, family lineage to own a home. And it's very easily easy to do. And I show people how to do that and once I show them how to do that they acquire their first property and then two to three years later now they're actual investors they can buy fix sell buy fix rent and possibly create that opportunity for someone else because I don't care how high you are there's no success attached to it unless you're reaching your hand down for somebody else to pull them up and you can actually do that in my space in my situation in my legs in my in my business without hurting someone you can do it by helping someone. Like, I wake up every day proud of what I do. I love what I do. Right? I'm literally changing communities. I'm changing mindsets. I'm speaking. I'm reaching people. And I've never been on a, like, as far as a social platform, I've never been, like, Instagram famous. I've never had a need to obtain any type of attention from social media because I actually do it. Like, what I mean by I do it is I, do, I, I run these businesses. I'm the CEO. 17 years, I haven't worked for somebody else. This is what I do. I didn't need to, in my mind, um, stand on a soapbox and show you how great I am and pretty much monetize the fact that whatever, a lot of people who are in this actual space, what they do is they stand on a soapbox and they tell you how great they are at what they do when it comes to real estate, but they actually don't even do it. They don't even practice it. Maybe they did it, they did it at one time for 10 minutes. Maybe they're learning it. But because they're such great marketers or great speakers, or they're so attractive, you'll believe that that's the person you should follow. Me, I've been so busy on building my businesses and creating, um, and because I have like such deep, great organizations with great people, with great cultures, I never felt the need to be on social media and stand in front of people and just stand on my soapbox. So because I actually do it in real life, it's never been a thing for me to like create, like I literally created an Instagram page like, I don't know, weeks ago. <laughs> and it was like, it was just like something to do. And a Facebook profile, I think I just did like the other day. My marketing, like we just did it, but it's not because I need, I didn't do it to tell you what I'm doing selfishly. I did it so you can learn from me intentfully I did it with intention the intention I didn't have anything to say before now I understand that even though I don't I might not have as much to say people need to hear so many people need to hear what this country is about like we, the, you need to understand what's the what's the offer in this country a lot of people don't understand and it's not as difficult as people think and there are different aspects of it right there's creating freedom by wholesaling and that's a thing right creating some type of um wealth from wholesaling which is you know a to b to c which is um you play in the arbitrage middle where you're locking down a contract and you're selling that contract to another person and correcting this, co collecting the spread in between like that's a thing there's so many differences and i've there's so i've done all of it 17 years bro. i went i did it i made a lot of money doing it. i got i went broke I had to build myself back up again. Like I've been 17 years. I've seen the entire bell curve of real estate. I've seen it all. So when you ask me about my action, like what I'm doing every single day, I love what I do. Like I love knowing that I'm changing. I have the ability to change communities. I love 
knowing that um, I can actually change someone's mindset and give them perspective, perspective on what they can really obtain and give them pr- perspective on the fact that I know you're 32 years old and you have a 10 year old and you're, and you came to my office to rent. And this is the third rental you've had in the last five years for whatever reason. And you're tired of this and you want to know how, how can I own a home? And when you're fed up, like I've seen that the tears of joy at a closing table that I get on the other side of the table, no matter what, position I play I can play many the thing about me I can play so many different positions at the closing table one of my I can come as the representative of the brokerage that sold you the home I can come as the mortgage lender that lent you the the money to buy the house I can come as the the investor that fixed it and sold it to you I can come at any from any perspective I can come of a multiple of those hats too but the amount of gratitude these people show me and the amount the, the the overwhelming sense of joy that I feel when this actually happens, when I know what I know, what this means to them, that's it for me. Like that's my euphoria. That's it for me. So, with that being said, man, it's just it's just different for me than it is for a lot of people. And I do real estate like for real in real life, like real, real, like in real life. Buy them, fix them, sell them, lend money on them, broke them raise funds so other people can, as far as investors, can invest money in it. I create investment opportunities for the other investors. I create home ownership opportunities for first-time home buyers. And I have a lot of insight. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to talk to you. We're going to talk to the people on a daily basis and let them know what's going on in the actual industry. As the real estate informant, I'm informing you as the real estate informant, what's going on in real estate and what you need to know. Because the majority of things that you should know, I probably forgot. What I mean by forgot, they're so far back in my brain, this is probably where a guy like Grant is. The things that these people actually need to know fundamentally, he's forgotten them. They're so far in the back of his brain because he's on another stratosphere. But what I do is I answer questions on a daily basis. I help people at the ground level on a daily basis. So I still understand. I get it. You know, I've created, I made my first million dollars in my 20s. It went crazy. And my 20s was 20 years ago. Think about that. So 17 years ago, uh, what was the spark that got you into real estate? Who, who, did you meet somebody? Did you decide this is what I want to do? What was that catalyst? The catalyst for me was um, a buddy of mine. He worked in a mortgage bank. And this is a regular guy. This is a regular street guy, right? And this is a guy who uh, sold clothes out of his trunk. Good friend of mine. And what I mean by clothes is, like literally, sold clothes out of his trunk. Mm-hmm. And it was nice clothes. <laughs> But he was like a hustler, mm-hmm. right? Anything he could get his hands on, he could sell. I remember one time he had like a pyramid scheme going on. It's like invest 200 bucks and you're going to get 2,000 bucks <laughs> in like a week. And I invested in they that. They all had like, that one friend. I got like 50 people to invest <laughs> in that thing. But he was a guy that always knew how to create money. He always knew how to create money. Shout out to Fred Norris. Wherever you are, Fred. Long time no see. He knew how to create. Like he knew how to make money. Always. And he... Came to my house one day, and all of a sudden he had like a, a brand new BMW. And I was doing all right. Like I was, I was doing really good. I wasn't in real estate yet, but I was still doing good. So came to my house in the BMW, and he's telling me, I'm like, Freddie, what are you doing? He's like, man, you have no idea. I do mortgages. I'm like, what? And at that point, I could barely even spell mortgage. I'm like, what do you mean mortgages? You? He's like, yeah, I'm helping people refinance their home. I'm helping putting people. I'm like, how? How'd you learn how to do that? And he told me it was relatively easy. And um, he explained to me what it was. I took a liking to it. We're talking about my first job, not my first real estate investment. This is my first job <laughs> in real estate. And I was like, all right, can like I want to do that? And he was like, because it was me, and I was like a stand up guy, and we had a great relationship. I don't think he would have done this for anyone because he actually knew the owner of the bank that I got the, my first job with. So he introduced me, he got me the interview, 
And um, at that particular point, because I rem- I'll forget, I'll never forget it. That particular point, I had like um, cornrow, and I like had an interview at this, and I was so serious about. It. I'd grown them for like seven years, and I was so like interested. Like I so wanted to do something different. And I wanted to take this. Jo- I wanted to get this job and not mess up this interview. I literally cut my all my hair off. Wow, seven years of hair because I wow. wanted to look, I wanted to look presentable. Well, that's dedication right there. Jeez. Man, tell me about it. it was difficult at the moment. I was like <laughs> a little different the person. <laughs> so I showed up. I came to the job. went to the interview. You know, I landed the job. Um, I landed the job, but the prerequisite to the job was I had to go to a uh, like a training course and pass the training course. So I went to the training course, and I passed it. I got the job. I was making a draw, so there was no actual salary. And um, I didn't know much about the industry within... Uh, six months, I ran that entire department because I was determined and I was reading books and I would literally spend my weekends in Barnes and Nobles. If you guys aren't familiar with Barnes and Nobles, Barnes and Nobles is a, or was a bookstore chain that you can actually sit in. It was part bookstore and part Starbucks. <laughs> yep. So you can yep. literally, it's like going to Starbucks, you get like one cup of coffee or you buy like a bottle of water. I was never a coffee drinker and I could pretty much not buy the books, but treat it like the library. And just pick up different books off the shelf and just read them. And I think I probably read every book pertaining to the mortgage industry three times oh, wow. each. And that propelled me to, as far as a knowledge base, to learn about mortgages. And then post that, now I'm doing all this work as a mortgage um, loan officer. <laughs> and I'm, I, one day I sold a... I cre- I don't want to say created. I was a loan officer for a purchase mortgage where someone was buying a home. And the commission structure was in such a way that um, it wasn't a ton of money. So if I sold the home for 500000 I think my commission, I might have made like five grand off the mortgage. And believe me, that's still good money. But based on what was available at the time, like that wasn't a lot. And I went to the table, the closing table, to you know say to walk the people through the process because they were actually my clients. And I saw a check fly across the table and it had the real realtor's name, the company of the realtor that actually literally opened the door, let the people in. They said they wanted it. He closed the door. And as far as, in my head, this is how he worked. They called him, said, I want to buy a house. He went to the house, opened the door, let him in. They said, yes, I love it. He got back in the car. They signed the contract. They sent me to do all the dirty work as far as getting a mortgage. Paperwork, wow. W-2s, verification, <laughs> appraisals, titles, talk to attorneys, you know, play referee. So that was my job. And I'm like, all you did was went, opened the door one time, and then you closed it, and his check was for $30,000. Wow. I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on. It's $500,000 mortgage. <laughs> the check is 30000 How did he just make $30,000, and I did all the work, and I only made five? And I'm getting taxed on it. And it looks like he's not even getting, this is a clean check for $30,000 to this guy. I said, oh, I need to be in more. I need, to, I need some of that. I need a little taste. <laughs> I need a little taste of that. So um, at that point, I uh, started to do some research on what it took to be a real estate professional agent broker. Um, so based on the amount of loans I had closed at that particular time as a mortgage banker, I immediately qualified to become a real estate broker, not an agent. Because at that time, I already closed hundreds of mortgage loans, and I had been in the bank. I mean, I had been in the industry long enough that I now have the ability to become a real estate broker. Wait a minute. Being a real estate broker means you can immediately open your own office. (laughs) How long? Literally, I took my real estate agent's test on a Tuesday and I took my real estate broker's test the next week on a Thursday. So I never, you just needed the qualifications. Typically to become a real estate broker in New York, what you need to do is you need to be in the industry. You had to be a real estate agent for at least two years. You had to have a certain amount of sales. Um, But for me, I superseded all that. I kind of got grandfathered in because of my mortgage knowledge. Mortgage knowledge supersedes real estate knowledge because in order to like, facilitate an actual mortgage loan for someone, you got to know a lot more than a real estate agent has to know to open an attorney. No disrespect to realtors. Shout out to the brokers out there, and agents out there. <laughs> but it's, um, like I said, the mortgage now supersedes it. So being that it superseded, I am not qualified to be a broker. Being that I qualified to be a broker, I opened my own brokerage um, uh, immediately. 
<laughs> didn't know what I was doing, right? But immediately, I knew I had good intent, and I, as long as I had good intent, and God was going to take this walk with me, I believed that it was going to work out, and it did until two thousand and eight. Oh, <laughs> but um, yeah, man. I I I started as a mortgage loan officer, and I started creating my empire when I shifted um by one particular moment. And that's usually like usually all it takes in life. It, it some it only takes it sometimes it only takes one moment. It takes one moment for you to have one decision to change your entire life. And for me, that one moment, with that one decision. We're seeing that $30,000 check. <laughs> and now I want to repeat something. I didn't know where you were going with this. <laughs> so it wasn't that deep. But that's what it was. So um, from that point, and then, like I said, then I established, I learned, and I learned, I, I, you know, I'm buying houses, I'm fixing them, I'm selling them, I'm becoming a real estate, I'm doing all these things. And then at a particular time, and I lost, I had to figure it out and do it all over again. But at a particular, t- like, at a certain point, like, I've literally, I've literally, like, woken up, opened the slider on my balcony and looked out the window. I looked and stood on my balcony and was like, what am I going to spend money on today? I got like literally said mm-hmm. to myself, what should I buy today? And there's nothing that was in my mind, my little mind, that I couldn't buy at that particular moment. And I would literally like find, stupid, immature, I'm young now. I'm in my young 20s. I would find reasons to spend money. I would find, I would make up reasons to spend money. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a thing. It was just coming so fast. I just had to, my job was to make it, and my job was also to spend it at that point <laughs> in my life. You know, so um, then as you progress and you get older and, you know, you, you start to appreciate it more and you respect it, and then you start to understand your calling and your purpose and why you do things. And some of us don't actually have the opportunity to do all these things. And I was blessed and fortunate enough to have the opportunity to do all, to see all phases of it. Like some guys, they'll see it and then they'll lose it and they'll never get it back. Right? So I saw it. I lost it. Stayed determined, stayed focused, stayed prayerful, and I got it all back again. And then life, things happened in life. Not being the guy that tried to figure out what to spend money on every day, but I, due to circumstance, lost it again, had to get it back, and it happened a couple of times. But, at some point through all of that, when you're at the actual top of the mountain and you're looking down, now when I open my balcony door, I'm standing in my yard. I'm standing, like looking at my ocean view. I'm asking myself a different question. Now I'm asking myself, whose life can I change? Like, who can I help? How can I create another me? Where is the guy like me out there right now that really wants it? And what can I do to help give him a shot? And that's why... It, you guys know personally that the organization that we have here, the opportunity that I create, is for people who actually want it, and they want to do it. You know, and that's what I do now. Like I create not not only opportunities for the people who work with and for me, I create opportunity for real estate investors who actually want to invest in real estate, but they don't know it. They don't know how to yet. But the foundation of that is owning your own home. And I'm not saying this for me to me. You might be in. Listen. You can be in Chicago right now. You can be in L.A. right now. You can be in Arizona. You can be in Texas. I don't do real estate in those places. No matter where you are, I'm telling you, the very first thing you need to do is own your home. If you if it's a situation you don't know how to do it, two years on a job, 620 credit score, and a down payment. You can own a home. It starts there. Stop renting. Buy a home. And uh, you mentioned when you first started that you were working on a draw. Now, that would scare a lot of people. And I'm sure you've seen it when you were getting started, colleagues that you saw when you were getting started. So um, how did you manage that nervous energy knowing I have to make these deals and it's coming out? And how do I keep that going? Because what often happens with many people on that structure is they get so stuck on that nervous energy, they're always chasing that next sale, that they're not saving that money when it comes in for those dry spills. So how did you manage that when you were getting started? Well, when I was getting started, and as far as the draw, it pertains to an actual draw, I didn't look at the drawer's income. So what happens with a draw is 
when you look at the draw as income, then you focus on the wrong thing. You become co- you become like comfortable. Any sales job that you have, you should never look at your draw as actual income. That should be your in case of emergency break glass. Like mm-hmm. that's your gas, food, money. If you're in any type of sales environment or sales job, your draw is not there for you to like get rich off of. Mm-hmm. Your draw is there to sustain the basics in life so you can like get to work mm-hmm. and eat lunch. And you bank that draw and you live like a minimalist until you start making money. If you're under the impression that you just took a job and you got a draw and you're treating that draw like a salary, you got the wrong mindset. So any entrepreneur taking on any sales job and they're actual and they're offering an actual draw, keep your eye on the prize. Focus on that main thing. Whatever that real commission is, because if there's a draw attached and there's a commission, you focus on that commission. You don't lose sight on that commission. And you don't become complacent and you don't become comfortable. Right? You keep gas in your car. Eat ramen if you have to. And I'm dead serious. You live a minimalist life. Don't ball on a budget. And at the end of the day, if you focus on that main thing, it'll work for you. But you have to be focused on the actual goal, which is the bigger piece of commission. Because there's usually a chunk of commission. There's like a big thing. But people get so focused on whatever that draw amount. People will actually fight for a draw amount. <laughs> like if you fight for a draw amount, then you really don't intend on doing the job that they put they hired you for anyway. You have no passion for whatever it is that you're Mm-hmm. Whatever job that you actually have anyway. Like you don't even think you can do it. If you're fighting for it, and let's be clear, I don't offer a draw in any of my companies. Me per none of my companies don't offer a draw. I have salaries and I have commissions in some positions. I just make sure that the commission base just so far supersedes the salary that you want to get whatever that bonus structure commission dollar amount is. I don't want you to live off of the salary, but I don't want you to die. Because you don't have one. <laughs> right? So the draw situation, depending on what it is you do, you always have to be focused on whatever that thing is, that light at the end of the tunnel, and stay, keep your eyes on the prize, as they say. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going we're gonna to look at another one of uh, Grant Cardone's uh, quotes, and just to hear some of your feedback on this one. Uh, so we're going to take a look at and play supposedly? Just because you supposedly own something, which means you got a mortgage on it that you don't own, and even if you did pay it off, you still got to make the property taxes. It, it, just because it makes a little bit of money doesn't mean it makes sense. What? Run that guy. Just because you supposedly own something, which means you got a mortgage on it that you don't own, and even if you did pay it off, you still got to make the property taxes. It, it, just because it makes a little bit of money doesn't mean it makes sense. I had to throw I'm that still, one. I'm still trying to figure out. I, I, I had don't to you need a little bit of money to eventually get a lot of it? I, that's what I was thinking. That's why I just wanted to hear what you had to say about that. Bro, I don't... Listen. Damn. I don't want to <laughs> sound stuck on stupid, but I don't know what just happened. It was like some confusion. <laughs> can, we just, can we just one more time? It's like one more time. Let me hear it one more time. That was, listen, that was, listen, I'm so, listen, he's so smart and I feel so dumb because I don't get it or the other way around. I don't know what's going on, but he's really, really super smart and he said something that's so deep, like I got, it's going to take a minute because it went over my head mm-hmm. or oh, that shit was so simple <laughs> that I can't even grab it. So let's figure that out. Run that one more time. Three times, three times a charm. Just because you supposedly own something, Just cause you're supposed to which means you got a mortgage on it that you don't own, you got a mortgage on it that you and own. even if you did pay it off, you still got to make the property taxes. It, it, just because it makes a little bit of money doesn't mean it makes sense. All right, I don't. All right, see, I think the, you should have left out the last part. So, <laughs> is that where it got confusing? The end. Yeah, it's like we have to live. Check it out. It's a great country. What you got to realize is. You can create wealth and you can make money in this country. But you have to live in, the, you have to operate in the confines of the tax code. 
and you have to pay property <laughs> tax on the pro- like this is that's where this is America. Like you have to pay property. Okay, you have to. So obviously, I don't like I don't I don't understand. Like, so he was saying, I mean, from where I heard it, I was saying like just because you don't own it. As in, you don't own it until the mortgage is paid off. Then even when the mortgage is paid off, you still have to pay the property taxes. But doesn't everybody have to do that? That's what I'm saying. Like, uh, that's my point. Like, you're still going to have to pay. First of all, we're not even getting into the financial benefits that it comes. Like, when you own a home, any accountant, any attorney will tell you the biggest financial investment that you can make that will allow you to flip the bird to the IRS is real estate. So what do you mean? Like I said, it's just confusing. Yes. It's confusing at times. So I don't, I don't agree with that, I guess. Because I don't even understand. I can't say I agree with it or I don't because I didn't understand it. But because I didn't understand it, I don't agree. (laughs) (laughs) That was easy. (laughs) Where's the easy button? <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, those were the three. Those were the three um, sound bites for Grant Cardone. We had some great analysis here. Uh, great background. Uh, great backstory of everything that we're doing. Um, you know, what would you like to say to the audience? You know, separates you from Grant Cardone. How how you get started? Uh, what would what would you departing to the audience? Um, it's not. I don't know about the separating me from Grant situation because, like I said, I'm now at a financial space, right? And I've been tutored by the game. Like I've learned so much that I understand a lot of these concepts that he's bringing to the table. I get it. However, a lot of people aren't and don't. And I don't agree with everything he says. I do agree with some things that he says. At the same time, you have to start somewhere. So I'm here for those who want to start from the beginning to they can so they can get to a place that they really understand and get what he's actually they can accomplish that thing. I'm not saying he's wrong. Like you make it into a grant version. I don't it's not even that. Like there's just certain things about the conversation that was just had on a platform that I watch, I know, and I know that my people know and watch, and I got so many <sighs> inquiries and phone calls and friend like people that I do, they ask me about, like, they brought it to my attention, like, you guy, because, you know, <laughs> every time, like, when I'm away, because a lot of times I'm out gaining information, I'm gaining knowledge, I'm going to events, I'm meeting speakers, um, a lot of guys influential, influential, and, and making noise in the space, and I, I like to go and see what's going on. Not that I'm trying to like, obviously, like I'm supporting their movements because I like some of the things that I see. And I'm investing in my people when they go to learn a lot, so I'll constantly get the weird, I don't know where the energy's coming from. <laughs> friends that hit me and they're like, "Oh, did you go to that thing?" And I'm like, "Yeah, what's that thing?" And now it's like, I got a bunch of, that's your boy. Did you hear your boy on Vlad TV? It's like, <laughs> what are you talking about? So I had to just um, bring to light, this, you know, a few things that I don't I don't agree with. And it just it just needs to be further explained before we um, jump the gun and think that everyone's going to buy an apartment and a great building through their LLC and rent it to themselves. Because that's not going to be a thing because you're not going to be able to even obtain the loan to buy the investment property in part and rent to yourself until you actually own one yourself. Like you own some piece of real estate and understanding that a path to that freedom, a path to that accumulation of wealth can easily start by you owning your own home and then later refinancing, taking cash out. And understand, like, I don't even want to get into credit. Let's not even get into the That'll be the next that, episode. Like, let's not get into the fact that you actually have to have at least three installment loans, which will be usually real estate, all those things that you actually pay down to pay off. And then you want three to five revolving pieces of credit, which are things that you pay on to pay down, but they revolve to reach optimal credit. We're not even going to get into that, but you need to achieve those things. And the fastest way to get your biggest investment, usually, typically, is your very first home. And for us, 
when I say us, I mean us. It's like you gotta own a piece of real estate. You have to own like my my my. If I were a keynote speaker, and this was a keynote event, then the title of the keynote would be: Every person needs to understand the power of ownership. And that'll be it. You have to understand the power of ownership. It'll be the greatest power you acquire for the least cost financially. Investing, period. Three and a half percent of whatever you want to obtain. You save that three and a half percent and there's a loan for you. Wow. You know, and it's just, that's the start, man. Like, stop changing. Let's just own where you live. School district to school district, hopping and hopping and letting your life be determined, the course of your life to be determined by the person who owns the home that you actually live in. Like, let me not, let me not use the, I don't want to go down that hole, but right. ownership is ownership. Like, at, are you a slave to your landlord? Are you a slave to the mind. rental industry? You have the ability to own. It's yours. I never thought about it like that. Wow. Because if you don't own it, it's not yours. And I don't want to go crazy, but that's the mentality of a slave. Wow. You're going to tell me where I can live and for how long? I need to own my own so I can decide how long I want to live there for and when I want to get rid of it and dump it. And if you can, some people won't rent to couples. Some people won't rent with people with pets. Couples, with kids. dogs, too young, you're black, you're white, you're Mexican, you're Muslim. Yeah. I'm not yeah. going to rent to you. So where are you going to, like, what are you, so what are you doing? Mm-hmm. What are you doing? Where's your actual foundation? You don't have one. It's slippery. You don't have a foundation. It's too slippery. Yeah. It's based on how somebody else feels about what they want to do with their finances at that point in their life, whether or not you actually have somewhere to live at, at certain points if you're a tenant. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. And like I said, we don't, we want to control the narrative of our lives. And you do that by owning. Can't nobody put you out. You go work, you get the money, you pay the mortgage off, great. Go work and get the money and pay the taxes off. Because you got to do it anyways, right? Exactly. <laughs> You know, uh, this whole pride of ownership thing, I guess inadvertently he's downplaying that. And that's a, that, that the, the, the psychology and the pride of ownership is what takes you to that next step, aside from leveraging your name. Because you have to leverage your name, of course, but owning a home, it gives you that confidence to take those steps yeah. that, that somebody who's renting just is surviving, not really thriving, just surviving and playing it safe. Let me ask you a question. You want to get personal? Yeah. Okay. Cool. You rent or own? Rent. Okay. Ask your question. How much is your rent? It's two thousand. Two thousand dollars per month. I need to borrow someone's phone. Somebody give me a phone. I'll do some math. An iPhone preferably because I know how to work the calculator. Okay. Let's have some guys. Sorry about that. <laughs> so your rent's two thousand a month. All right. Have you ever thought of owning a home? You know, to be honest with you, I guess I thought I was a tall giraffe. I've, I've, I just always thought that, you know, uh, until I heard this conversation with you right now, I always thought it was a bad idea to buy something because then I'd be stuck to it. But then when I think about what you're saying, it kind of strikes a nerve with me because I thought, you know, I just never wanted to be tied down to anything. And I felt like I can always be static and moving, but, you know, I can't I can't buy a house because I'm not So so let me ask you a question. That's what you thought you couldn't buy a house. But if you're paying two thousand dollars a month in rent right now, based on what I know where you live and you live here, Long Island, yeah. you can find something with a property tax of seven thousand dollars. You can easily afford a home for three hundred thousand dollars. And it'll be yours. And for the first five years, the majority of your mortgage payment is interest. Not too much principal. So whatever your income tax, like whatever your tax return is right now, mm-hmm. it's at least double because you're going to get your mortgage interest back, the majority of it, because you own now. So my question to you is, what do you do 
When did you sign your last lease? Um, July. About five months ago. So you got about, mm, see, about six, you got to start making decisions. Good decisions. Like you got to make hard decisions in about another five months. Whether or not you're going to renew your lease or you're going to buy something. Right or wrong. Right. What if you go to renew your lease and your landlord says, uh, mm, buddy, I want to sell. I don't want to rent to you again. Oh, boy. What do you do? I'm scrambling. Scrambling what? Now you're scrambling. You're looking for somewhere else to live. You're trying to find another landlord that will accept you. And because you're at a time crunch, you're also hoping you get accepted in an area that you want to live in or else you'll fall into an area that you don't because you have to make a rash decision. You got to move fast. And it's you and your significant other and you're making decisions for other people. You don't determine your own future right now. Your landlord does. The guy that you pay the rent to every single the person that you gave twenty four thousand dollars of your hard earned money to this year determines your financial future for next year. What I'm telling you is that same two thousand dollars a month, you can guarantee your future for that same two thousand two hundred two thousand a month. Your actual apartment that you moved in, you paid first month rent, you paid last month rent. You paid security, and you paid a broker fee to get into. Am I right or wrong? You're right. You paid eight thousand dollars to get into an apartment. To get in, eight grand. If you'd have bought a house for three hundred thousand dollars, you put three and a half percent down. Yeah. Three, seven, five, eleven, five. That was that close. And you would have bought it, and you would secure your own future. Oh, not eleven five. Um, excuse me. Three, six, nine, three, fifteen, ten five. Ten five. You would have been in you would have owned it. And no one could ever tell you you have to go. Wow. And the fact that you lived there a year, and this has been a this market has been frothy. This has been a good real estate market. So if you'd have bought it five months ago, you'd have seen it appreciate over time. It'd been worth a little bit more. Then when you filed your taxes next year, you'd have seen a little, you know. A little bump? Come back. Well, you got a little piece back. <laughs> What's your landlord giving you back at the end of the year? <laughs> $50 increase. Exactly. <laughs> wow. You, do you feel me though? But the major, a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people don't. The majority of, of us don't know this. And you're a guy who was actually, you're an avid, you're an, you're an extreme capitalist. Extreme. Right. I'm sitting across the table from a guy, and I know you personally. Yeah. Like, I know you. Who's your, who's your, who's your. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even go there. Who'd you. <laughs> there. Let's just say, let's just say. Right. Once, let, let, let's just say once upon a time, did you not work for the president of the United States of America yes, right yes, now? Yes, I did. Did you not work for Donald Trump once yes, upon a time? Did. Yes, I did. Did that relationship cause you to have an affinity for him? Maybe. Yes, it did. Okay. I mean, I, I, and do you, because I know awesome. you. Does, yeah. Do you still have that affinity? Yes. Okay, absolutely. So I'm looking at you, and I'm telling you, you have that affinity, and you understand capitalism, and you're because of capitalism. Right. Why don't you know capitalist shit? <laughs> because I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. I guess after this conversation, I kind of realized something is that I kind of believed in the stuff that Grant Cardone was saying as far as not owning any property and just but and I just didn't think long enough that I don't really have the capital to think that way <laughs> but so should I be I'm, a president? Such, I'm such a capitalist should I be a president now? I think you you'd be a good candidate now? for 2020 <laughs> <laughs> maybe 2024 you know what I mean to be fair but no I, I just I really you know I thought like a big guy I'm not a big guy I thought like a big guy because, you know. That's the problem. He's trying to convert everyone's man. Like, let me not. I don't want it to sound like I'm taking shots at this guy. But he's speaking to big guys. The problem is big guys aren't the only ears listening. That's the problem. And there aren't too many big guys taking the information that they're listening from another big guy and translating that into a way that the smaller guy that wants to be big 
needs to be spoken to. And that's my job as the real estate informant. What you just said, just drop the mic. Look, I might not be the biggest of the guys, but I'm, I get it. I get the conversation. But what has to happen is the big guy, some big guy, some big guys have to take that information and translate that to the guy who wants to be big and they're not that big yet. And that's what I do. That's my mission. That's my goal. The real estate informant. I'm informing people on exactly how to become the big guy. Because nobody else is. The real estate informant.